merchant. There we go. Okay, so if this is your formal welcome to coaching a first Lego league team uh, using Scratch, whether it's called EV3 Classroom for the EV3 or Word Blocks for Spike Prime. Uh, they're both Scratch based, adapted by Lego Education for their uh, two robotic sets. There is another language for a graphical language for EV3, but it's uh, hard to get a copy of that because Lego is no longer supporting it. Oh, uh, Anne asked, uh, tell me about myself. Oh, okay. Um, that's a dangerous question because I've been doing this for 20 years. And uh, even that is predated by teaching Lego Robotics for Saturday Academy um, in about 1999 or 2000, or maybe both. And it was about then that I learned about uh, the existence of First Lego League and was foolish enough to contact First in New Hampshire. And that led to holding a meeting and a whole bunch of good people from a variety of universities and nonprofits agreed we ought to bring it to Oregon. And for a long time, it was under the umbrella of the Oregon University system. But in 2014, it was spun out. By coincidence, that was the same year I retired. Um, so I helped form a nonprofit, and that's now an independent nonprofit. I'm on the board and serving tonight as a volunteer. Uh, I'll be mentioning a couple of the, the uh, staff members. There's a bunch of great staff members that make it all happen, uh, but a good part of it is still volunteer based. Uh, so that might help a little bit. Terry Alexander is another volunteer that uh, may be teaching this class this fall. She certainly was a big help uh, last summer and fall. Uh, she's a high school teacher that's quite busy getting school started. Uh, some of you are probably in the same mode right now. Uh, or, but given uh, you're doing first Lego League, uh, you're probably more likely middle school or even more likely elementary school. Uh, either teaching or parents or some combination. Debbie Kerr is a key staff member with the Oregon Robotics Tournament Outreach Program. She's director of programs. Um, there's her email. And either she or I will be happy to direct you to other staff members, depending on what your question is or concern. So feel free to email either of us. And I will be sending you a copy of these slides uh, probably tomorrow. Um, so we're going to be exploring uh, programming in Scratch over four sessions. Tonight we're going to be talking about making the robot move, and then uh, we'll transition over the future nights into making it a smart robot and uh, more advanced programming features um, that make it a more predictable robot. So this is an outline for the whole four sessions. Uh, tonight will be motors and movement. And you can see some of the other things we'll be covering later. Some of them may look somewhat obvious and some are in jargon. We'll expand on those. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Um, if you want to create a new block out of blocks that already exist, you, there's a feature called My Blocks. And it is conceptually similar to what professional programmers call subroutines or procedures, uh, various names for the notion of creating a new function out of existing things. Very powerful concept that we'll get to later in the week. So uh, I'm here to help you prepare to coach and teach the kids. Um, we're going to go over stuff that you won't be giving the kids in the first week, and they may never need it uh, in their if it's their first season. But at least you'll know the lay of the land. Um, no matter how much you learn this week and in future weeks, uh, repeat the mantra: the kids do the work. Um, your goal is to get the kids to know more than you do about this stuff, uh, so they're teaching you. Uh, they'll learn that stuff by discovery and reading and. Uh, probably exploring the internet some uh, with your guidance. Um, 
when in doubt, ask questions uh, that you think might engender the kind of thinking that will lead to the right answer. Try not to give them the uh, right answer because the depth of learning would be much greater if they discover it themselves and that's more fair. And um, besides, if you try to give them the right answer, you may give them the wrong answer. So Scratch is designed from the ground up as an educational language originally for kids, but it is used by plenty of adults uh, worldwide. Most people use Scratch in the cloud where you get on the internet and write programs that do things and you don't have to install things on your computer. The version that Lego uses does install on your computer and we'll talk about which computers, um, but a hint is uh, Windows 10 computers and now Windows 11. Um, most uh, modern Mac computers, um, Android computers like Chromebooks and Android-based uh, pads and Mac-based pads. Uh, so quite a few platforms um, and pretty much the same language on all platforms is an occasional difference, but not significant ones. So let me take a breath and take any questions about what I've covered so far. Ann. Oh, unmute. Um, so as I am, as I'm understanding it, Bruce, um, the scratch is normally used in the cloud and um, I've had my students use it at NASA websites, um, doing things with the Mars Rover. Um, and then I've had them just creating programs to, you know, create pictures or movements or whatever. So, but the Lego scratch program that we're going to be using is downloaded to our computer, either Chromebook or personal computer. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, there are some things that when you first download, um, it gives you menus and then you'll see an occasion, a menu where um, you have the option of downloading more stuff. Um, but assuming that you or the kids have downloaded the features that they wanna use, um, they can unplug from the internet when they're doing the actual programming because it's not actually done in the cloud. Um, okay. On occasion, they, they might, if, if you've got multiple computers involved or the kid, kids in different physical locations, you might wanna use uh, something like um, Google Docs go, uh, or, or Google Drive to transfer files from one computer to another. Um, that's a bit tricky to do, but feasible. Uh, but generally it's, it's not cloud-based. Any other questions at this point? Bruce, just a quick question. Um, I was curious about, um, so if you use it with an Android tablet, it would have to be your um, EV3 hub right, it has Bluetooth compatibility, correct? Um, but you would just, it's for tournament, right? That you absolutely cannot have Bluetooth on, is that correct? Oh, um, don't trust my uh, opinion as the final word because I don't check the, the rules each year, but I'm under the strong impression that in what's called the pit at a tournament, yeah. uh, they could use Bluetooth unless the tournament directors discovered that too much Bluetooth is causing all the Bluetooth not to work. So make sure that you bring the cable because the cable can be used instead of Bluetooth. Um, but uh, Bluetooth is more convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, where I, I'm sure it's against the rules is you do use Bluetooth at the competition table yeah. um, because um, the robot needs its programs already in it and uh, you don't it's a, uh, not fair play to be downloading programs uh, at the table. You can download programs either with Bluetooth or the cable, depending on the tournament uh, director's rules um, in the pit, and then carry the, um, the, the robot to the competition area. But uh, don't bring a computer to the competition area because that'll look like you're downloading programs, which is not a good idea. Hopefully that helps. It's a bit ambiguous, but um, it should help. Thank you. Any other questions, anybody? So we already talked about those two versions, uh, one for Spike Prime, one for uh, Mindstorms EV3. Um, it's on your computer. Um, 
I should uh, amend this third bullet. Once it's installed and you download any options that you want to use, then the internet's not required. Uh, key concepts. Programming is very literal. If, if you've coached kids in programming already, you've learned this. Um, if there's ever a difference between what the kids wanted the robot to do and what they told it to do, it will do what they told it to do, not what they wanted it to do. Uh, so one definition of debugging is changing the program so that what you told it to do is what you wanted it to do. Uh, occasionally, there'll be a flaw in the robot for one reason or another, but most of the time, it's because the instructions given to the robot were taken literally, and those literal instructions were not exactly what the kids had in mind, and they need to build a skill to find the differences. And I, I'll be giving some hints as to debugging techniques as we get into some of these features. Um, it's a bit analogous to uh, teaching a student to uh, make a, 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 a recipe. You can imagine in a culinary class, if um, the kids doing uh, the cooking uh, didn't actually see the ingredients, they were just told to reach out and pick up a bag and scoop something in. Um, the ambiguity between what they were told to do by the culinary instructor and the hypothetical blindfolded uh, children who didn't know uh, much about cooking, uh, there'd be quite a mess. Uh, the, the robot is essentially that. It, it has no judgment. It does what it's told, uh, no, no matter how silly that might be. Another concept for this programming language and most programming languages is the flow of control runs from top to bottom. Um, we learned in the uh, original EV3G or EV3 lab programming language that some languages run from left to right. And I suppose there are other languages that go some other way. Um, but you create stacks of blocks um, in Scratch and then uh, the two languages based on Scratch and uh, they execute from top to bottom. Uh, this slide is a bit premature. Uh, just kind of forewarning for something we'll probably won't cover until Wednesday. Uh, we'll be talking about loops. And, uh, and a rough analogy to a loop is stir until all the ingredients are spread evenly and no lumps remain. Um, they were saying repeat and you're giving a condition for how long that repetition should occur. Um, with rare exception, the loops in programming have a termination condition just like this uh, recipe instruction does. <coughs> Uh, another key concept that we'll get into <coughs> gradually and particularly on Wednesday is conditional execution. And a, again, a rough analogy is if you have baking powder, use it. Otherwise, mix baking soda with cream of tartar or uh, tartaric acid powder to get something similar to baking powder. Um, if then else is a, a, a key programming concept in most programming languages, not all. And it, is, uh, it does exist in Scratch and the languages we're, we're dealing with. I'm not going to ask for questions yet on that because we could get into stuff that we don't want to talk about until uh, Wednesday. But this is kind of a foreshadow of, of things to come. Um, so what are the differences between EV3 class and the Spike Prime? The noticeable differences are based on the fact that the kits are different. Um, the, the motors uh, in the two kits are somewhat different because they're different generations of, of Lego. Uh, they plug into the hub differently and not radically differently, but just different enough to make uh, required differences in the blocks that refer to the motors. Um, the sensors are very similar between the two kits, but not identical. Uh, so the programming blocks need to account for the differences. They plug into uh, the hub of the robot uh, similarly, but different. And we'll, we'll touch a little bit on the differences. Um, and those differences are reflected in the, uh, the language. The display on the robot is different. Let's see if I hold this up here. 
That's an EB3 display, it's an LCD display. If you get real close to it, um, you can see get a lot of information off of this little display. Not quite as much as a computer screen, but it's essentially a miniature computer screen that's uh, displayed quite a bit of information. In uh, bad lighting, uh, you have to squint and uh, hold it in a certain way to, to see it, but a lot of detail. Um, Spike Prime at first appears to not have a display at all. There's no screen. But when you turn it on, um, after just a few seconds, uh, the white part actually lights up with these dots and various patterns can be displayed, including numbers of programs, the number zero, one, two, three. So that's the display, radically different display. And when you go to program the display, which is a, there's an occasional reason to do that, the programming blocks are different because the displays are different. Um, the sounds the robots can make are somewhat different as well. Uh, there's some limitations that are different on what kind of sounds. Um, the Spike Prime robot um, makes certain beeping sounds by itself. It has a little tiny speaker, but um, when it meows, I'm pretty sure all the meowing and the other uh, more interesting sounds actually come out of the computer. Um, and if they're close to each other, you may not be able to tell, but if you set um, the robot on the playing field and the uh, meowing sounds com comes out of the computer, uh, you'll notice the difference. Questions about uh, these differences in the two languages before we get into the actual examples? Uh, just making note, a couple more people have joined us, Anjana and Jeremy, welcome. So here's uh, a couple of examples that we'll do live on the real programming. This is uh, this Spike Prime uh, environment where you uh, can say you want a new project and then it asks you, well, do you want to do this new project in word blocks or in Python? And um, tonight we're, we'll always use uh, word blocks. There's also a brand new thing called icon blocks, which I haven't explored. I'm under the impression that icon blocks are the equivalent of word blocks, but they don't have English words in them. They're more language independent. Uh, you might wonder why uh, Lego had the audacity of using English words in all these blocks, given the number of languages in the world and the uh, first Lego League is international. Well, I'm under the strong impression that when you install this, it asks you what language or checks, asks your computer what language, and it adapts to the language of your choice, but inevitably can't support all languages under the sun. Um, so the icon blocks are useful for those uh, people that don't speak one of the languages that it does support. And some people may just have a preference for the icon blocks uh, being a bit more graphical. Um, EV3 Classroom uh, lays out pretty similarly. Um, and when you say new project, um, you get a, a new project window and I haven't actually uh, explored how you bring up Python for EV3 Classroom, but it is available. And this, uh, perhaps it's a different place in the same menus. I haven't looked lately. So tonight we're gonna to focus on uh, motors and movement. Um, all movement is ba based on motors, but in the first Lego League world, almost all robots have two wheels. They might have four wheels, um, or in this case, they have two wheels and a caster, um, but most of, the, most of the designs involve two drive wheels. Uh, in this case, you might call that front wheel drive. Um, so you could try to uh, drive this robot by giving instructions to uh, these two motors individually, 
but it gets very complicated very quickly. So uh, Lego has done the world and added to scratch, done the world a favor by adding to scratch movement blocks that control a pair of motors at, at the same time. So when you or the kids want to cause the robot to move around on the playing field, whether it's Spike Prime or EV3, you're going to want to use movement blocks. And so we're going to focus on those first tonight. Um, if your robot has one motor, then you're probably going to want to use a motor block because there's no pair of motors to control movement with. Uh, but more likely, it's going to have three or four motors. Um, this robot has two medium motors for driving the wheels and a large motor that's kind of underneath and in front that can drive a mechanism. There's another design that Lego has uh, that's a more co uh, competition ready design, which has another large motor in the back. And both of the, those large motors would be handled by, as motors, while the, the wheels would, uh, in both robots would be handled uh, with moving blocks. And same pattern holds on the CV3. There's a motor in the middle that's not driving wheels, it's driving this mechanism in front, and we will use the motor blocks to control it. <coughs> Now, for historic reasons, the uh, EV3 and Spike Prime have different ways of connecting. <coughs> Spike Prime <coughs> has six connectors. And when you first look at this white brick, it looks like they're unlabeled. But if you squint, you can actually see the labels on mine because I've taken a pencil and I've rubbed on the white on white embossing and I'm doing that on the F now because I didn't do it before. And then if I kind of smudge that out and hold it, hopefully the camera focuses and you can see a little gray on white uh, F that's labeling this connector, this port right here. Um, so I would recommend that you or the kids uh, use a pencil on, on your hub so that it's easier to see the A through A, B, C, D, E, F labeling the ports. Uh, in Spike Prime, you can connect sensors to any of those ports. You can connect motors to any of those ports, as long as you tell the program what your decisions were. That's different on EV3, where you connect the motors to the ports that are numbered um, on, the, on the bottom or back. This side, the screen is up here, um, and they're numbered ports or where the motors go. You can have up to four motors and four sensors are connected A, B, C, D um, on this side. So at first glance, this looks like you get eight when on this one you get six. Uh, and that's almost true, except on this one, if you want a gyro sensor, you have to plug it in. So that counts against the limit of four sensors. On this one, you could have three uh, external sensors, three motors, and the gyro doesn't count because the gyro is built in. So that would be four sensors and three motors, still a total of seven instead of eight, but pretty close. Um, my convention is I use on this robot, I'm using C and D uh, for my wheel motors. I could have just as easily used A and B or E and F. I do not recommend using uh, things that are not opposite each other. It'll be very confusing. The, the uh, robot will allow you to do that, but the human mind will quickly become confused. So I recommend using a port, the a pair A, B, C, D, or E, F for the wheel motors. So this is what I already told you about uh, Spike Prime. Motors are A, B, C, D. Sensors are one, two, three, four. Um, the, uh, another hint for applies to both is um, while you might get away in, uh, at a, a team meeting with having wires like this all over the place, um, when you're uh, at a competition and they snag something on the competition field, uh, that's going to be very frustrating. So have the kids find a way to route the cables more neatly than I show on this robot, uh, perhaps rooting it underneath so that uh, the cables stay out of the way of things the robot might get close to. Uh, Spike Prime comes with these very clever little clips um, 
that you can put the cables through and then uh, a peg through the clip and the peg in a hole and that holds holds them nice and tight if you are judicious in using those clips. So in Spike Prime, you need to tell it um, where you've plugged in the motors. And I said C and D. And so there's a display. I'll do this live in a few minutes. But you can see a block that reads as a word block, set movement motors to C and D. If I clicked on A and B, I would then be promising the program that I had faithfully plugged in uh, the left motor to A and the right motor to B. Uh, but that would not be true of this robot. Uh, this robot matches what you see on the screen uh, where the left motor is plugged into C and the right motor is plugged into D. And in Spike Prime, you use a very similar block, um, but you have four choices instead of six because there are four places for motors and four places for sensors. So, um, We've chosen B, B and C here for Spike Prime, excuse me, for EV3. Another block that I recommend you use at the beginning of every program is to tell it how big your wheels are. Um, uh, oh, no, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, it would be best if we had already done that, but uh, this example jumps right in and says, uh, move, Forward, that's this icon means forward. Uh, sometimes it uses the word forward, but in this case, it, it uses a clockwise arrow to mean forward for 10 centimeters. But notice where it says centimeters, I could have said centimeters, inches, rotations of the axle, degrees of rotation of the axle, or move for a certain number of elapsed seconds. So five different ways of controlling how long it'll move with this particular move block. With EV3, um, you'll have three choices instead of five. You have rotations, number of rotations of the axle, number of degrees, 360 degrees per rotation, or the number of elapsed seconds. What if within EV3 classroom, the kids want to go a certain number of centimeters or inches? They've got to do some math. Either they have to do it on paper, uh, determine in advance how many rotations or degrees, or um, they need to put that into their program. Um, and at the risk of, of getting pretty complicated pretty fast for fourth graders, um, they need to know that uh, if the wheel has got a diameter of one inch, let's say, uh, its circumference is about 3.14 inches. So if they wanna go 6.2 inches, that's two rotations. So they're gonna have to do that math, they're gonna have to teaching those formulas. There's also a website that will, uh, you can look these things up and uh, I'll demonstrate that for you in a minute. Uh, so in that regard, EV3 Classroom requires a little bit more sophistication uh, from the kids. Uh, if they wanna program a certain distance, they have to do the math either on paper or in their programs. Uh, the Spike Prime word blocks, in most cases, uh, will do the math for the kids as long as they faithfully tell the program what the circumference of the wheels on the robot are. Uh, these particular wheels are 17.5 centimeters in, in circumference. And you'll see that come up when we do examples. There's the block. I, uh, this is the one I thought I was gonna talk about first because it usually in a program would come before the actual movement. You would tell the program to set one motor rotation to correspond to the circumference of a wheel of 17 and a half centimeters, unless you're using bigger wheels, in which case you need to fill in a different number here. And you tell the robot that, not because it's nosy, but because it wants to do the kids a favor and do that math for them. When they say a distance, it will uh, calculate the number of rotations for them because you've given it the circumference of the wheels. For the EV3, they can either know the formulas that you teach them, or they can go to this website. Uh, and again, this will be in the slides and they can either uh, put in the uh, information about their wheels uh, where it says input your wheel diameter. 
it multiplies by pi to get the circumference and divides that by the distance to get the number of rotations or degrees. Or you can select the wheel that's on the robot. Uh, this particular wheel looks very similar to, uh, to the basic tire. If I click on that, I can have it do the math for me. If I say I want it to go uh, 20, um, oops, it fills that in 56. And I want to go 20 inches. Calculate. It says um, that's equivalent in uh, 20 inches to 50.8 centimeters, which um, with a circumference of 17.59 uh, for that particular wheel is uh, this is too many digits by far, but the number of rotations would be uh, about 2.9 and the number of degrees would be uh, about 1,040. So that's kind of convenient, but also kind of confusing. So that's why I like uh, Spike Prime better when it comes to going a particular distance. Um, now, it just occurred to me that the vagarities of screen share may mean that, that none of that showed on your screen. Uh, Colette, did you see it on your screen? It did. I was, my mind was blown a little bit. I was like, I wish I knew about that for so long. Okay, good. Yeah, and we saw it. Yeah. Good. Some, sometimes when you switch um, one place to another in, uh, in Zoom, it, it doesn't share it until you give it permission. Thanks for the confirmation on that. All right. So you also want to tell it how fast to go. You, I would recommend this block go at the beginning of every program. Uh, it doesn't have to be 50%. It uh, might be 25, might be 75, might even be 100%. When you're using sensors, um, the sensors will be able to, to help the program make a decision very quickly. But physics will cause the robot to skid if you tell it to go from 100% to zero. Um, it would be like uh, uh, jamming on the brakes uh, on the freeway. Um, so when, when you know that sensors are gonna be used to make a decision, you may wanna slow the robot down so it, um, it behaves according to the program rather than skidding off to one side or going farther than you thought it would be. Um, so I usually start at about between 25 and 50% speed and then as I uh, work on the program, I might have it go faster than that sometimes and slower than that other times. Uh, here's a block to that <coughs> says start moving straight and then a separate block to stop moving. If you put these two uh, back to back, it'll start and then immediately stop, which is not very useful. So in practice, you would have some other blocks in between. You might say start moving and then uh, wait for five seconds and then stop moving. The wait does not tell the robot to stop. It tells the program to wait and the program waits for that number of seconds. And then it goes to the next block. And then if the next block said stop moving, it would stop moving. As this graphic here uh, implies, you don't have to go straight. In, in the real language, which we'll show in a moment, you can drag this to the right and it'll turn right. If you drag it all the way to this direction, it doesn't uh, turn around always. It, it turns in place for uh, the amount of turn that you tell it to turn. And that'll make more sense when, we, when I demonstrate it. Uh, so you can do a gradual turn. You can do uh, a fairly sharp turn. You can turn in place or you can go straight forward with this block. There's another block you would use if you wanted to back up. Uh, this is the same uh, with EV3. Notice how almost identical these blocks are. So when possible, Legos made the blocks the same with only subtle differences. Um, but on occasion, the blocks will be quite different because the robots are different. <coughs> So here are a pair of uh, little programs that come right out of a lesson that comes with Spike Prime. When the program starts, set the movement motors to C and D. You're just informing it where you plug those motors in. 
uh, set the movement speed to 50% and set uh, one rotation to 17 and a half centimeters because you happen to know that that's the circumference of the wheels that uh, you or the kids are using. Uh, it could go on to tell it to move, but there's a clever feature in this language that allows you to tell it to not do the next thing until you push the left or the right button. And those are on the robot um, on each side of the circle button. And we'll, we'll demonstrate that. Um, here's an example in the EV3 classroom um, where when the left button is pressed, um, it moves over for two seconds. The program uh, then waits for uh, one second. Since you haven't told anything to do, the robot will also wait. Um, then it moves backwards for 720 degrees. That's two rotations, right? 360 degrees per rotation. And then moves forward, not for a number of rotations, but for a particular number of seconds. We'll try to demonstrate some of that in a minute. Um, buried in Spike Prime are eight additional movement blocks, which we'll try to get to as we have time. Um, they're not in the menus when you first bring up the program. If you go to the lower left, uh, you can add them in, um, and I'll show you how to do that. The, the, you look for this icon that I show uh, here, up here. You click on an icon that looks like a couple of <coughs> blocks in a plus sign, and then you select on more movement. It gives you, um, is this magenta? Uh, eight more magenta blocks. <coughs> oh, and then three more. Uh, EV3 has six more instead of uh, eight more. Then the uh, motor blocks, uh, you talk about individual motors, typically that uh, are driving an attachment uh, and might have gears, might have pulleys or belts. Um, typically not the drive wheels, uh, uh, typically an attachment or a grabber, a pusher, a puller. Um, you tell it which particular port you've got a motor connected to. In Spike Prime, you would you might say A or F or whatever, wherever you happen to plug that motor into. And with EV3, very similar, but because the brick is different, you don't you you select from A through D because there are four places you can connect motors on an EV3. Um, and then you tell it what to do with, uh, uh, like go uh, turn the, the um, motor axle uh, clockwise or counterclockwise for a certain number of rotations, number of degrees or number of seconds. Notice how similar the spike prime and EV3 uh, blocks are here. They're almost identical. There's a, uh, this one on spike prime is a little bit more graphical Somebody just made an arbitrary decision to use the English word clockwise or counterclockwise for EV3 and to use um, the graphics for Spike Prime, but otherwise they look pretty identical. And here are examples of using those blocks in Spike Prime in a, a lesson called Training Camp 2. Um, in Spike Prime, you can also move to a particular position um, that's a pretty advanced thing. I'll try to show you that if we have uh, time. But uh, if you, if the, you or the kids want to use that, you need to know that it's relative to little dots that you can almost not see. Um, if you look right there, there's a dot, a, a, a circle on the white. And if you rotate the blue, eventually there's a dot. And when the circle and the dot are lined up, that's zero degrees. And so if you want to use this feature, you want to start with those lined up, and then you can have the program uh, go to a particular position um, from zero to 360 by using this particular block. I'm going over this too fast to give you kind of a lay of the land. Um, you can also ask it, what is the current position or what is the current speed? And then you have, a, 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 you can also add more blue motor blocks. If, if the ones we've talked about fast forward are, are not comprehensive enough, uh, Spike Prime has another nine that you can add by uh, 
clicking on this special icon and saying more motors. It doesn't give you more motors unless you bought them. It gives you more blocks for controlling the motors. And this is a homework assignment that um, you'll, you'll see on your uh, handout when I email it to you in the morning. Uh, this is quite optional, but something you, you might want to explore either tomorrow or when you have time. So I've just covered all the material in a, in a way that's almost incomprehensible because I've just showed you stuff on slides and I haven't showed you much about the real robot other than holding it up. So let me take a breath. I'm gonna stop the share of my slides and I'm going to do a new share. I'll, I'll arbitrarily pick, uh, pick Spike Prime, but they're pretty, uh, pretty similar as we've already started to see. And I could, when you have time, I recommend you hit the start button. It'll take you through some introduction in Spike Prime. In the EV3 uh, classroom has similar feature for getting you started. But I'm going to jump into uh, the home screen. Um, let's see, I got to move my chat box. The clock on my my project. You can see that I've been doing this for a while, but I'm going to create a new project. Uh, bear with me. Did they change the screen or did I confuse myself? Okay, I'm just gonna pick an old project and then I'm gonna say, file, new project. There's an icon for that as well. Now it wants to know whether I want to use icon blocks, word blocks, or Python. I wanna use word blocks. I click on that and I say, create. It gives me a new project. There's an icon for that that I couldn't see on the screen and the pressure of the moment. Since I've been doing this for a while, it, it named it Project 11. That's not very descriptive. So I'm going to use the three dots here, and I'm going to rename it to today's date, which I think is September 6. And say save. You can see that in gray on white here. At the bottom, there's a, a magnifying glass. If I hit plus, it'll make these blocks bigger. And there, it filled that one in for us. When program starts, it will do nothing because we haven't given anything to do. So I'm going to assume we want to uh, drive the robot around first. So I'm going to tell it to set the movement speed to 25% by filling in 25 there. I'm going to tell it my robot has its movement motors at C and D. And I'm going to tell it my wheels have uh, my one motor rotation corresponds to a circumference of 17 and a half centimeters, which happens to be correct for my robot. Um, and then I'm going to tell it to move forward for 10 centimeters, I could have said backwards or turn in place uh, to the left or turn in place to the right. We'll do that time permitting. So here's my first program. I should have started with this, but I was a slave to my slides and showed you way too much stuff. But here's a very simple program. We've set the, the speed. We've told it where the motors are connected. We've set the circumference because it needs to know that so they can figure out how, how many rotations it needs to use to go 10 centimeters. Uh, you can guess by doing the math in your head, it doesn't need to do a full rotation. If the circumference is 17 and a half, that feels more like what, six tenths of a, of a rotation. Um, maybe you can do the math better than I, but the robot will do the math. This program is not in this robot though. I need to connect my robot. I could do it with a cable. Instead, I'm going to do it with Bluetooth. Um, I'm going to say Bluetooth, 
I need to turn my robot on. Okay, uh, Spike Prime boots pretty quick. It just made a nice cheerful noise. Uh, it should list this, so I'm gonna X out of this and do it again, so it'll find my robot for me. There it is, it gives me three choices. Uh, this one happens to be this one here. It's connecting on Bluetooth. It made a beep noise. And now I can X out of this. The program is still not in the robot. If I click on the zero here, it'll make that big. Um, let's say I want to put it in slot two. I hit this arrow until it gets to two. And then I click this little tiny down arrow. Uh, will load or download that program into position two on this robot. And I think it did it. Um, so I'm going to switch cameras. I've got a webcam pointing at a mat, and I'm going to stop to share. Um, and you should be able to see the mat. And I'm going to set the robot down on the mat. And I'm going to select with the right arrow button here to get, until it gets to two. And then I'm going to push the center button to start the program. And it went forward by 10 centimeters. Pretty sophisticated program, but it did exactly what we told it to do. So now I'm going to go back and share again. And I'm going to add a block. But instead of going another 10 centimeters, I'm going to tell it to turn in place. And I happen to know that a nine centimeter turn in place is pretty close to a right hand turn. And then I'm going to tell it to go forward another 10 centimeters. I think I'll change this to a left turn given where it is on the mat. And then I'm gonna tell it to turn in place again, but I'm gonna tell it 18 centimeters, which should be pretty close to 180 degrees. So let me read the program. That's an advantage of word blocks there, We're pretty readable programs. When the program starts, set the movement speed to 25%, set the movement mode of C and D, set one rotation to 17 and a half centimeters, move forward for 10 centimeters, turn in place for nine centimeters, move forward for 10 centimeters, uh, turn in place for 18 centimeters, which should uh, be pretty much to turn around. If I start my robot now, it'll do the old program because I haven't downloaded that. So I'm going to click on the download button and it's now in the robot. I'm going to stop the share to make this bigger on some of your screens and I'm going to push the button again. So it did what I told it to do. Didn't follow the road, but it did exactly what I told it to do. So let's go a little crazy and see if we can get it to follow the road by dead reckoning. I'm going to move this. I'm going to put in a new, let's say eight centimeters forward. Start, I'm going to start it from where I just put the robot at the beginning of the road. Then I'm going to tell it to turn right by turning in place for nine centimeters.
And then I'm going to tell it go straight for 30 centimeters and then turn left and then go forward for let's say 20 centimeters and then turn in place to the right for nine centimeters, which should be approximately right turn. So this is just ballparking it in the interest of time. But <clears throat> if I measured it, I'd get to do better. But I want it to go forward, turn right, go downfield for ways, turn left, and go towards where the cat is, and then turn right at the cat. And it's not going to get anywhere close because I have not used my metric tape measure. I, that's what I should do. Uh, maybe I, if there's an extra minute at the end, I'll do that. Um, so I need to download that. And stop the share. Okay, nowhere close to the cat. Now there are two messages here. Um, one is if I want to use dead reckoning, I should at least take a few minutes to measure this distance. With this tape, uh, I've got both inches and centimeters. That distance is 63 centimeters about. If I, and this distance here is about 70 centimeters. Uh, 17 centimeters, excuse me, 63 and 17. So I need to change my program. Um, so let's go over time for just a second. And change the downfield run to 63. I still wasn't real careful, so that's not gonna be quite right. And change this to 17. And then download. And then drop the share. Okay, that was much closer, um, but that brings us to our second key message, and that is dead reckoning doesn't work very well because these are just toy robots, and the friction and the battery charge will be a little different every time. Um, so if the kids uh, use dead reckoning, they might get it to, uh, to a particular location one out of five times. That's not a very good way to score points reliably. So we're going to start talking about sensors tomorrow. And sensors will be uh, allow us to do things like follow the edge of a road, um, uh, potentially do a much more precise turn using the gyro. Um, there are other sensors we may get to later, but uh, with just two sensors, we can make this robot much more reliably uh, get to a particular location and score points and uh, make the kids much happier. So uh, uh, it's just past eight. Let me switch cameras if I can remember to, how to do that. There's me. Um, and any questions before we adjourn until tomorrow? Uh, Anne is muted. I don't know if she. Yeah, I was just saying it was really cool. Yeah. Thanks for your patience, and um, I'll, I'll try to keep it even more interactive tomorrow as, and show you uh, real stuff with on the screen and, and with the real robot. I'll try to alternate between the two types of robots and uh, try to get, get uh, as many questions answered as, as you guys can shoot at me. Um, Should we be trying to I do have this? Chat on my screen, if, if I don't reply to a chat, just shout out the question or tell me to look at the chat. There's a question in chat. Right now, I think I've covered the ones in chat. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording for, for tonight. Give me a second to do that. Uh...